It's a pleasure uh, for me to introduce uh, Dr. Miriam Greenberg. She holds a professorship actually at the Department of Biological Sciences, Wayne State University in Detroit. Miriam has a long-standing reputation, ob obviously, in the field of Bart syndrome, and she has exploited yeast al already for many years, and many of the things we know about the function we deduced from her studies, and she also made a step now into higher eukaryotes, actually. Um, Miriam, the floor is yours. I would look, I'm looking forward to your presentation which has to do with uh, meta metabolic consequences of defective iron homeostasis in cardiolipin deficient cells. Thank you very much, Ronald. Um, I think that uh, yesterday's plenary speaker really nailed it when he said that, uh, that we as uh, scientists, when we meet with clinicians and the families, we really have a tremendous uh, power to uh, make progress in this field. Uh, I feel really very honored and privileged to be here and to be able to uh, participate in this meeting and to uh, share the, the work from my laboratory and also the work of my students. Um, I do have one uh, sort of regret, and that is uh, uh, having to speak after Valerian is a, a little bit like, you know, the, the, the Daily Show is over and now you're talking about the weather. So <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure what I can do about that, so. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about the work of uh, three of my students. Wen Jia Lu and, uh, and Yiran Li are here, and they had posters yesterday. I'm also going to talk about the work of Vaishnavi Raja, who I was not able to uh, come to the meeting. Now, uh, uh, coming at the end of the meeting, is, is, it's a really a big advantage because I don't have to have any slides about what is cardiolipin, and I don't have to have any slides about what is Barth syndrome, which is really an amazing treat. But, uh, but I have noticed that there have not been an overwhelming number of talks that use the yeast model. So um, I would like to just say a, a few words about the, the, the advantages of, of the yeast model. Although, again, I, I really can't compete with what Valerian has said. But um, uh, we use, uh, sorry, we use yeast to, um, because of the, the uh, amazing genetic and molecular tools um, that we can, uh, we can develop um, mechanistic hypotheses that we can then test in mammalian cells. Now for mammalian cells, we have been using Barth lymphoblasts, but uh, as a yeast geneticist, to not have an isogenic control is really, is very difficult. So, uh, to deal with this, we, um, we constructed a Tefazin knockout uh, mouse C2-C12 cell line, as, uh, actually the work of Wenja that I'm going to talk about later. And um, so using, uh, uh, we, we now use both of these models. And the advantages of the yeast system uh, are, are, are summarized here, uh, specifically for Barth research. Um, the biochemical defects of, of uh, loss of Tefazin are also seen in the yeast has one model. And in fact, we've taken the human gene and put it in yeast and it complements the defects uh, really well. Um, there are well characterized yeast mutants for every step of cardiolipin synthesis. And uh, th these are, are really tremendously useful. And also, uh, what's not possible in higher eukaryotes is uh, a, a number of genetic tools um, such as uh, one that I will talk about today, which is synthetic, synthetic genetic analysis, where we look for synthetic lethal mutations. But we have really a, a whole arsenal of genetic tools that we can use to, um, to uh, 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 look at the mechanisms underlying uh, cardiolipin function. So here you can see uh, mutants of these genes um, in, uh, uh, in the yeast system. This is the de novo synthesis and remodeling. And uh, the, the TAS1 mutant of this gene is the Barth model, and um, <clears throat> we've, we and, and others have shown that, that it has the, the, the main biochemical attributes that are, that are seen in Barth cells, which include a decreased cardiolipin, increased monolysocardiolipin, and decreased unsaturated cardiolipin acyl species. We also have this very powerful mutant CLD1, which, which Valerian uh, talked about. And CLD1 is powerful because it, in yeast, it's the only cardiolipin phospholipase. So if you knock out CLD1, 
uh, the CLD1 mutant, you, you have a system that cannot do cardiolipin remodeling at all. And it, it allows us to ask, what is the function of cardiolipin remodeling? And so um, if you delete cardiolipin uh, CLD1 and you knock out cardiolipin remodeling, it turns out that you actually rescue the defects of the TAS1 mutant. Now, the CLD1 mutant uh, does not, is not able to uh, do any remodeling, so there's no remodeled cardiolipin. So that says that of these three uh, major biochemical phenotypes, it's very unlikely, at least in the yeast system, that, that the pathology in yeast is due to a decrease in unsaturated, fatty, uh, unsaturated cardiolipin species. But I would just suggest that <clears throat> I don't believe that there's any evidence in, in mammalian cells in, in, that, that the defect is due to a lack of unsaturated um, uh, a cardiolipin species. I mean, that has really yet to be determined. So uh, these studies we, uh, we published, um, uh, along with um, Stephen Claypool's lab <coughs> a couple of years ago, showing that uh, deletion of CLD1 rescues the uh, tofazin uh, phenotype. So what then is the function of cardiolipin remodeling? Uh, I'm not going to talk about that today, but just point out that my student, Jaja G had a, a poster in which uh, she shows that we are now starting to use a synthetic uh, genetic analysis screen to look for synthetic lethals to get some idea of what, uh, what cardiolipin remodeling is for. But now, if, if really the cause of the defect is, is either decreased cardiolipin or increased monolysocardiolipin, at least we can use uh, a, another mutant, CRD1, um, as, a, as, a, as a powerful way to eliminate cardiolipin entirely. And so that's the mutant that I'm going to talk about today, the CRD1 mutant, which has uh, no cardiolipin synthase and thus no cardiolipin. Uh, the mammalian models, as I mentioned, we also generated a um, C2C12 mouse uh, TAS um, knockout. This is uh, Wenjia's work. And I want to say a special thanks to Doug Strathdy, who, uh, who we met at the last BSF meeting, and that's how we knew uh, that, that um, he had uh, a, a CRISPR plasmid that turned out to be extremely uh, useful for us in, in, uh, in generating this cell line. So, so th uh, thanks to, to uh, Doug. Um, so uh, this cell line has um, a, a very, very decreased uh, mRNA and um, with the uh, uh, antibody that um, Michael and Yang sent us, we, we, we can see here that there's a Western showing that there's, there's essentially no detectable tofazin. And uh, it has the characteristic increased monolysocardiolipin and also somewhat decreased uh, respiration. So um, we think this is a very good model now to, um, of, of a metabolically active um, cell, but it's not quite as difficult to work with as, say, cardiomyocytes. Now, the focus of my talk today is on energy metabolism. And in a, a kind of simplistic way, you can, you can look at energy metabolism as having three, component, three major components. Acetyl-CoA synthesis, from, uh, either from pyruvate in the mitochondria or from acetate in, in, in the PDH bypass uh, of the cytosol or beta oxidation. And um, then we have the TCA cycle. Uh, uh, acetyl-CoA feeds into the TCA cycle. The TCA cycle generates NADH for oxidative phosphorylation and also uh, important, um, is also important uh, metabolites, amino acids and other metabolites. And then we have oxidative phosphorylation, which generates ATP. Now, a lot of work has been done uh, in, in my lab and in other labs showing that oxidative phosphorylation is perturbed in cardiolipin-deficient cells. Um, and, uh, you know, just to summarize the highlights, uh, we know that there is a, a, a decreased stability of super, super complexes, uh, perturbation of respiratory control, and then the, uh, the sequelae from that, a decreased membrane potential, and decreased res respiratory enzyme activity. Um, but what I, I'm not going to talk about uh, uh, OXFAS today. What I'd like to talk about, though, is the TCA cycle and acetyl-CoA and our studies that, that show that both uh, both pathways are, are, are perturbed in cardiolipin deficient cells. So uh, I, I have three uh, sort of sub-themes. They're, they're not really independent. Everything is sort of interdependent, but, but for the purposes of simplicity, we, I'd like to talk about iron sulfur biogenesis, the TCA cycle, and then acetyl-CoA synthesis. So uh, first, uh, uh, iron sulfur biogenesis. A number of years ago, 
uh, my uh, former student, Dr. Vinay Patel, uh, did a really interesting study in which he showed that iron sulfur biogenesis is uh, defective in cardiolipin deficient cells. Iron sulfur uh, clusters are uh, either two irons and two sulfurs or four irons and four sulfurs. Uh, these clusters are essential cofactors in, in, in many, uh, in many um, cellular pathways, including pathways of energy metabolism. And um, it, it turns out that iron sulfur cluster bio, biogenesis is not the simple, it's not as simple as you, you take iron, you take sulfur, you mix them together. It doesn't work that way. It's actually a, a, a very complex um, process that you can, you can it, it's very highly conserved incidentally from yeast to humans. And you can, uh, it can be um, seen in, as uh, two, two major steps. In the first step, um, iron is escorted to the scaffold, iron sulfur scaffold, by this protein, YFH1, or frataxin, which we heard about yesterday. And um, sulfur from cysteine is, uh, is uh, gotten from cysteine and escorted to the, to the scaffold by all of these um, uh, very uh, important and actually essential proteins. And so that's the first step. And then in the second step, the, the iron sulfur cluster is transferred to an apoprotein uh, to make the active holoprotein. Again, many, uh, many important proteins are involved in, in this step. And, and there, are, there are a number of iron sulfur enzymes in the cell. So Vinay showed that um, many iron sulfur enzymes exhibited decreased activity in the cardiolipin mutant, including the ones here. But I especially draw your attention to aconitase and succinate dehydrogenase. These iron sulfur uh, uh, requiring enzymes are enzymes of the TCA cycle. Um, so both of these enzymes are decreased in the yeast uh, CRD1 mutant. And uh, Wenja has now shown that there is a, a, a decrease, uh, about 50% in Barth lymphoblasts. And also, a, a decrease of e even more than 50% in the TAS knockout cell line. So this, this defect is, is, uh, is clearly conserved. So where do these enzymes fit into, the in, uh, fit into metabolism? Here's the TCA cycle. And here is aconitase. Here is succinate dehydrogenase. Um, you would imagine if these two uh, important enzymes are defective, that, that there would be deficiencies in the TCA cycle. And uh, uh, among many deficiencies that you could, that you could see or, or, or many indications that there's perturbation of the TCA cycle, you might expect to see a defect in glutamate, which feeds into the, it actually feeds into the TCA cycle um, in a sort of anaplerotic step and also is synthesized from alpha-ketoglutarate. Alpha so um, we decided to take a, a NMR metabolomics approach to look at uh, uh, metabolites of the TCA cycle in collaboration with Dr. Smitty Gupta at uh, Wayne State University. And uh, here, as, as we know from, from many of the really interesting studies that we, we heard in the last two days, there is a wealth of data that you get from this and, and how to really focus on the, the data that, that will give insight into the mechanism is, is, really, is really key. So um, even though the even though the, the metabolomics um, study is unbiased, still we look for um, uh, sp specific predictions that are based on our hypothesis. And we predicted that there would be a glutamate deficiency. Now, w when you have all of the data, and uh, you can, which is impossible really to show, but, but you can see that there are differences between the two things that you're comparing, in this case, the wild type and the CRD1 mutant, and, and you look for what metabolites cause the difference. So, um, these peaks uh, refer to metabolites that are more prevalent in, in, in whatever strain, excuse me, what strain that we're looking at. So here we can see consistent with the hypothesis in that there is a much more, uh, there's more glutamate in the wild type cells than in the CRD1 mutant, a, as predicted. Um, and what is consistent with that, if you grow yeast cells in a, in a stress condition, um, well, they don't grow as well as wild type, but if you add glutamate, it, it does rescue growth. So that all makes sense. Now, if you, if you do the, uh, when we did the metabolomics in the Barth, uh, the Barth lymphoblast line, we see the same thing, that the glutamate is, uh, um, is uh, deficient in the Barth line, much more prevalent in the, in the control cells. And in the TAS knockout cells, we see the same thing. 
glutamate stands out. N not only glutamate, but glutamate clearly stands out. So uh, in, in, in terms of this manifestation of the, of the, the TCA cycle defect, both econotase deficiency and, and uh, a, a glutamate deficiency, um, we can see that there is a conservation from yeast to humans. So what, what is the mechanism that links a, car, a, a deficiency of cardiolipin in the mitochondrial membrane to iron sulfur biogenesis, which occurs in the mitochondrial matrix? That's, that's a key question. And um, what, uh, what, we have, what, we, what we have found is that of the proteins that we have measured, that we've been able to measure, there seems to be a very clear decrease in YFH1, in the frataxin protein, the protein that causes Friedrich's ataxia when, when, when mutated. Um, so just a reminder uh, that uh, frataxin is a, is a protein that is uh, uh, processed twice, and uh, it functions, as I showed you, to deliver iron to the iron sulfur scaffold. Um, it's also an iron storage protein, and uh, deficiency results in, in Friedrich's ataxia, um, which, which has uh, these uh, symptoms that, um, that we heard about yesterday, including cardiomyopathy. So uh, now we get to Euron's work. Um, so Euron has showed that um, YFH1 is decreased in CRD1 cells. So here is the, the deletion mutant. This is where YFH1 is supposed to be on this Western. Uh, we can see that, that the mature protein is uh, deficient in the CRD1 mutant. Um, other iron sulfur proteins that we looked at were not uh, deficient. Um, so what, what could cause this deficiency? Well, there, there are at least two possibilities. One is we, we've shown a number of years ago that cardiolipin deficient cells show uh, defective import of proteins into the mitochondria. So you can envision that, that uh, YFH1 or frataxin, which is synthesized in the cytosol, has trouble getting into the mitochondria. Um, another possibility um, YFH1 here is, uh, enters the mitochondria through the TOM, the TOM complex. This is the precursor. And then it goes into the inner membrane through the TIM complex. And then here it's processed twice into an intermediate and in, in a, um, uh, a mature protein by the mitochondrial processing uh, peptidase, MPP. And so one can envision that, that this processing um, proce process is, is defective in the cardiolipin mutant. So we look to see whether either import or processing is defective in cardiolipin deficient cells. And uh, here we uh, collaborated with Dr. Thomas Becker at the Univers University of Freiburg. And in, in this experiment, uh, this looks at uh, import of S35 labeled YFH1 into mitochondria of wild type or CRD1 mutant cells. So um, what, what is very clear is that, uh, that over time, there's a decrease in, in the appearance of the mature um, YFH1 in the CRD1 mutant compared to, um, compared to the wild type. There also seems to be an accumulation of the uh, intermediate form. So this kind of sounds like a processing uh, a defect, but at this stage, we can't rule out that, that it's, uh, the defect is, um, is in import. Um, now, this is just to show you, without looking too much at the data, that we also looked at import of these other uh, FES proteins, and none of them shows uh, a, a defect. So it seems to be specific to YFH1. Now, we looked in, in Barth lymphoblasts to see if the defect is there. And here you can see, uh, um, the this is the um, look, a Western looking at the frataxin uh, protein, the precursor, intermediate, and mature form. There's a very clear uh, deficiency in the mature form. There's also a very, a very big decrease in the, in the precursor. Um, a little bit hard to interpret this um, uh, uh, this finding, but um, it, but it, but there is clearly a decrease in in the protein in the mature protein, and if we look in the TAS knockout cells, uh, we similarly we see a decrease in the mature form, and actually uh, somewhat of a decrease in the precursor as well. So. Uh, for taxin, uh, so this, this paper is a paper from about 20 years ago, which shows that for taxin may associate with cardiolipin in the mitochondrial uh, membrane. So we, we, we hypothesize that maybe cardiolipin mediates processing of YFH1 by somehow interacting with uh, the MPP. And um, as a first uh, experiment to, uh, to address, address this, uh, Euron looked to see if 
YFH1 binds to cardiolipin. So this is a protein lipid overlay assay where we're looking for binding of, of YFH1 to the lipids shown here. And you can see there's a very uh, clear uh, preference for binding to cardiolipin versus the other, other lipids. So at least um, the, the, the hypothesis is, is, is possible. So, so for this, um, for this uh, phase of the talk, um, what I would suggest is um, if we see a decrease in cardiolipin, um, this leads to decrease import and or processing of YFH1, and this causes a decrease in the synthesis of iron sulfur clusters, and therefore a, a defective um, iron uh, due to the decrease in, fr in frataxin, and therefore a decrease in, in, in enzymes that, in activity of enzymes that require iron sulfurs, um, including enzymes in the TCA cycle. So the TCA cycle defect l leads me to the second part of the, uh, of the talk, and here I'm going to uh, refer to um, the work of Vaishnavi Raja. So Vaishnavi uh, did a major experiment called Synthetic Genetic Array, SGA, in which um, we look for synthetic interactions between um, the yeast CRD1 mutant and all 4,800 mutants um, of non-essential yeast genes. Um, and in this SGA analysis, she came up with some very interesting mutants, including mutants in the TCA cycle and acetyl-CoA synthesis that I'm going to talk about shortly. But first, uh, since I, I, I know this is not an audience of yeast geneticists, um, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> so I just, just want to say a word about synthetic interaction. Um, so the principle of synthetic interaction is if you need two, two gene products to, to do a particular activity, uh, cellular activity, and you have both, call one A and, and one B, if you have both, the cell is fine. You have plenty. And even if you only have A and no B or B and no A, it's also fine. The cells, the cells can survive. But if you don't have A or B, then the cells are dead. So basically, we look for a condition where the cells that don't have CRD1, that don't have cardiolipin, basically, are dead. Under what synthetic condition? In other words, they have another mutation that makes the cells dead. So getting back to the TCA cycle now, um, in yeast, um, there, there is, in addition to the TCA cycle, there is the glyoxylate cycle, which replenishes TCA cycle intermediates. The glyoxylate cycle is in, in the peroxisome, and you can see uh, this kind of a, a, a abbreviated schematic of the cycle, but basically it ends up uh, synthesizing succinate, malate, and citrate, which can then go across the cytoplasm into the mitochondria and fill in what, what is missing in the TCA cycle. So, if there is a TCA cycle uh, defect, then you might expect that the cells will have a, a, a real requirement for the glyoxylate cycle in order to have TCA cycle intermediates. And uh, the geneticist way of answering this question is, is there, uh, is, is, is there synthetic lethality when you have a CRD1 mutant and a glyoxylate cycle mutant? And uh, so these are the, these are the, the gene names uh, and the mutant names. And so, um, uh, consistent with this prediction, so here is the, the single MLS1 malate synthase mutant. It grows fine. Here is the CRD1 mutant. This is the, M, the, the preferred temperature. It grows fine. These dots are colonies on the plate. But the, here's the double mutant, and it does not grow. This is a, a, a real synthetic lethal. And similarly, we see synthetic lethality. There's no growth here on the double mutant. CRD1 SIT2, so there's synthetic lethality with the SIT2 mutant. And here is synthetic lethality with the succinate dehydrogenase mutant. And then there's also synthetic lethality with the succinate fumarate transporter. So these are all mutants in, in, the, in the glyoxylate cycle. So the glyoxylate cycle is essential for viability of cardiolipin deficient cells. Okay. That's not really why Vaishnavi did the SGA screen. That's something that came out of the SGA screen. You know, we, 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 we were very happy to find it after we did the other studies. But, but, but basically, the, the screen is unbiased, and, and you get what you get. So it was quite interesting uh, when Vaishnavi found that CRD1 is synthetically lethal 
with PDH, pyruvate dehydrogenase mutants. Um, pyruvate dehydrogenase uh, is, is, is quite an interesting protein. There, there are many subunits. And so here, here is uh, the uh, growth of the double mutant. So you could see it's CRD1 is synthetic lethality with all of these mutants, all except for this one, um, in, in, indicating a pretty tight synthetic interaction. What is PDH? What is PDH? Pyruvate dehydrogenase converts pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. And PDH is not lethal. A PDH mut mutation is not lethal. Why? Because cells have at least three routes to making acetyl-CoA. So PDH is, is the way that acetyl-CoA is made in the mitochondria. But cells can also do beta-oxidation. Uh, in, in yeast, this is exclusively in, in the peroxisome, but uh, in mammalian cells, also in the mitochondria. And um, there's also the PDH bypass, where uh, pyruvate uh, through acetate is converted to acetyl-CoA. So if, if there is a, um, a, a, a defect in PDH, the reason that the mutant isn't, isn't lethal, isn't dead, is because there are other ways to make acetyl-CoA. Okay, uh, I'm trying to advance the slide, but not being successful. Now it's time to call Valerian back to tell some jokes. <laughs> Okay, looks like we're good. A little bit crooked, but uh, it's okay. This is what the slides look like after a beer. Okay, so, all right. So, so the, the PDH mutation suggests that there's an acetyl-CoA defect, and there is. So he, he, here um, we're measuring acetyl-CoA in uh, wild type and CRD1 cells, and you can see that there is a deficiency, which, which is, oops, is that me? Oh, okay. Oh. Okay. So this deficiency is more apparent as the cells are stressed with elevated temperature. 30 is the optimal temperature. 39 is really, really stress. And um, the, the defect is much more apparent um, in, in that case. And this is actually controlled for, for thank you, for cell number and uh, make sure that the cells haven't died in the process. Um, so are these other pathways defective? Now, here we, uh, we collaborated with um, uh, Ron and um, Ronald Vonders and um, uh, the people in his group, uh, Carlo von Rohrmann and Rikold Houtkooper. And incidentally, I have to just I have to say this as an aside. I should have said this while we were fixing the projector. But when I, when I, when I realized that I had to learn about fat, beta oxidation and carnitine shuttle and energy metabolism, and I started reading papers, all of the good papers were from Ronald Vonders. I mean, he, he is really, uh, he has done the pivotal work on, uh, I, I think, on energy metabolism. I, I learned so much from reading Ronald's papers. But so anyway, it was great to have the opportunity to uh, collaborate with him. Um, so in this experiment, looking at beta oxidation of fatty acids, um, there's just a sort of a moderate decrease. And actually, I think Carlo uh, von Rohrmann doesn't consider this much of a, a decrease. But if you look at the PDH bypass, this, this is a, a little bit, uh, this is a different story. So the PDH bypass converts, ultimately converts acetate to acetyl-CoA. So if, what happens when you grow the yeast cells on acetate as the sole carbon source? That's, that's uh, here, the CRD1 mutant doesn't grow, cannot grow on acetate, whereas the wild type, uh, the wild type grows fine. This is the same, uh, the same question looking in liquid media. Here's growth of the wild type. Here's growth of CRD1 on acetate. This is consistent with perturbation of the PDH bypass. And there's also, um, if we look at acetyl-CoA levels um, in, in CRD1 cells uh, grown on acetate, we also see a decrease in acetyl-CoA levels. So this, this tells us that the, the likely cause of the acetyl-CoA deficiency in, in the cardiolipin mutant cells 
is in perturbation of the PDH bypass. Um, okay, there's one more uh, kind of uh, supplementary pathway that cells have that, that uh, help out when acetyl-CoA needs to be shuttled from, from cytoplasm to organelle, and that is the uh, carnitine shuttle. So this uh, transfers acetyl-CoA, uh, among other things, into the mitochondrial matrix. So if there is a problem with acetyl-CoA, you might expect that, that supplementing with carnitine would, would be beneficial to the cells. Um, so now this paper was published about 30 years ago. This paper shows that uh, when looking at carnitine, acylcarnitine translocase, this is, this is the enzyme that translocates cardiolipin in, in across the membrane, that in vitro, this requires cardiolipin. So um, again, in, in, in uh, collaboration with, uh, with uh, Dr. Vonders, then we see that carnitine, acetylcarnitine translocase activity is significantly decreased about 40% in the, in the CRD1 um, mutant. And uh, I don't know if you can see this uh, very clearly here, but, but here, looking at growth of CRD1 cells in a, a condition that is uh, very stressful, without supplement, they don't grow. But if you add carnitine, you can s start to see some growth and also uh, acetylcarnitine. So this also rescues growth of the, of the uh, mutant. So to summarize, um, I hope that I've shown you that, that cardiolipin deficient cells have an iron sulfur biogenesis defect. This is, uh, leads to, that, that, is, that is due either to defective import or defective processing of YFH1 or frataxin. And this we see in, in both yeast and mammalian cells. That there is a TCA cycle defect in, in cardiolipin deficient cells. Um, with decreased activity of TCA cycle enzymes, this is also conserved from yeast to humans, and decreased glutamate and other metabolites also conserved. And in yeast, we see anaplerotic rescue by the glyoxylate cycle. Um, we also see a defect in, uh, in the CRD1 cells in acetyl-CoA synthesis. We, we believe that it's due to defective PDH bypass. And, um, uh, I, I'm predicting that the, that the enzyme that is defective is acetyl-CoA synthetase, which sort of uh, uh, exists um, for a time on the outer mitochondrial membrane and may uh, require cardiolipin for activity. Uh, and we also see some rescue by carnitine. So, so here's the model. Um, there's a deficiency of cardiolipin in the membrane, uh, decreased YFH1, resulting in a decrease in, in iron sulfur, um, def a defective TCA cycle, which, is, uh, which leads to cells becoming dependent on, on anaplerotic supplementation in yeast from the glyoxylate cycle, and possibly a, a decrease in um, this enzyme, acetyl-CoA synthetase, which is um, f uh, part of the pyruvate um, uh, PDH bypass. So essentially, in, in cardiolipin-deficient cells, all components of energy metabolism, are, all three major components are perturbed. So, of course, we're, we're interested in, in, in how is this relevant to uh, Barth syndrome. In, in Barth syndrome, the clinical phenotypes we know vary very much from, from asymptomatic to uh, a neonatal death. And so, and why is this, we still don't know, of course, but at least one possibility is that functions of cardiolipin may identify the modifiers. So, for example, if, 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 if a, a patient has a, a deficiency in, of carnitine, let's say, uh, perhaps this exacerbates the, the phenotype. Or a deficiency in something that feeds into the, the TCA cycle exacerbates the, 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 um, the phenotype. And if, this, if we can identify these, uh, uh, we can identify these um, components, this may um, alleviate uh, deficiencies. Um, Actually, I wanted to um, mention that I, I said that there, were, <laughs> there was a deficiency in, in yeast talks, but, but actually there was a, a very interesting poster yesterday from uh, Deborah from University of Bordeaux. I don't know. Are you here? I, I'm very sorry, but I can't pronounce your last name. That's what it is. Anyway, <laughs> this was a very interesting poster, and I, I think that um, uh, we, don't ex we don't have exactly the same findings, but they seem to be pointing in the, in the same direction. Uh, direction. So um, I'd like to especially thank the people. I've mentioned the people in my, in my lab, uh, 
um, already who have done the work. Um, these are my collaborators at Wayne, at Wayne uh, uh, Krishna Rao Madhipati, who is the um, director of the lipidomics core, uh, Smiti uh, Gupta, who we did the m metabolomics with, uh, Mike Hutteman, um, we uh, do respiration studies, Sarah Trimpen also uh, uh, to, uh, uh, do mass spectrometry. Um, this wonderful group um, uh, in, in Amsterdam that I was extremely lucky to have met during my, uh, on my first sabbatical, when, right when Peter Fredeken discovered that, that uh, tefazin was a, a, a cardiolipin reacylating enzyme. Uh, also Thomas Becker at the University of Freiburg. Um, of course, uh, you know, we, we, we have to acknowledge NIH, of course, but, but I especially want to uh, acknowledge the support from the Barth Syndrome Foundation, because um, g um, grants that I have gotten from the BSF have, have led directly to um, uh, my, um, one grant that I had, uh, an R21, um, looking for synthetic lethals. This was, uh, this NIH grant came really directly from a BSF grant, from the work that we did on the BSF grant. And, and my, my current grant on uh, NIH R01, looking at TCA cycle in, in cardiolipin deficient cells, really came after getting um, uh, pilot grants from the BSF. So th this support is really, is really overwhelming. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Miriam, for this fascinating presentation. Yes, we have questions. Uh, you were showing that uh, complex three activity was down, though you didn't emphasize it. Is the iron sulfur subunit decreased in your cardiolipin deficient uh, uh, yeast, the risky iron sulfur protein? Um, <clears throat> The, the, the only ones that, I, that we looked at are the, the proteins that I uh, mentioned. Um, but I, I'm, I'm guessing that, that most, if not all, of the iron sulfur proteins probably are, are defective. So you show that the YFH1 is, is not expressed as much in delta CRD1 strains under stress conditions, right? Uh, under stress conditions? Like 37 degrees Celsius. Is that, is that correct? Right. So what happens at a normal, happy 30? <laughs> so, but when you do the import assays with the, with the isolated mitochondria, you do the, you check it at 24 degrees Celsius, and you see a defective in, in the import of OFH1. So how do you explain the difference in the stress conditions versus non-stress conditions? Um, I, what I think is is that you know we can, you can we can almost always see a defect, but the defect is is much more exacerbated if if you stress the cells in some way, such as with increased temperature. Uh, I, I I don't know that we did the did we do the the, the import experiment in different temperatures. The in vitro mitochondria import experiment are also pre culturally at uh, elevated temperature, which is 36, I think. And uh, the 24 degree, I think, is uh, Thomas Baker. Uh, what they do is include the temperature for incubation of the mitochondria with the uh, uh, YFH1. So it's still stressed. Uh, Mirren, uh, you have shown that uh, your uh, carolipin synthase mutant or, or the tafatin mutant that has a higher ROS level, yes. you, you showed before. And from my reading, it seems that a colonidase is very sensitive to, to the ROS in activation. And uh, could that be the, another reason why you have a, a decreased uh, colonidase? A, a cause for econotase, uh, de uh, de decreased econotase? I, I, I think it could be. But econotase is not the only enzyme that is, uh, mm -hmm. that is affected. But it could easily be by increased ROS. Okay. Last question. Beautiful talk. Um, I have a couple of quick questions. When is your YFH1 processing defect? Um, is that due to the um, proteinase, a couple of proteinase identified by uh, Thomas Langer? He's talked about those proteinase is very important for the processing of mitochondrial enzyme. Another is uh, <coughs> the, uh <coughs> so your CRD mutant would have accumulation of PG. How much of that would be due to increase the PG level? I know you uh, cross-check with your um, uh, the test mutant, um, but I'm just wondering how much of the upregulated PG level um, would uh, cause some of the defect here. 
Well, uh, I don't know that I can answer that question. I mean, there is increased PG in the CRD1 mutant. Um, so what we see could be because of a lack of CL, could be because of an increase in PG. Um, you're right. I, I don't know. Okay, thanks, Miriam.